episode had a real nice synergy to it, which we're going to talk about. But first, I can't believe that all the X-Men and the entire planet of Earth thinks that Xavier is dead when he's really off in space being Lalandra's bitch. Oh, I'm sorry. Professor Bitch, thank you very much. But, ah, oh, man, as even Xavier himself says this episode, so dramatic. Ah, oh, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills stuff. So uh, X-Men, though. Uh, and speaking of uh, drama, uh, Xavier has a history of dick moves in the comics, but he's overall such a nice guy and does fund the X-Men financially that I guess that's why he keeps getting away, f- away with it. I guess he and Tony Stark can, uh, can, uh, can toast to that. They're so wealthy that uh, they, they keep getting away with it. Because they, they, you know, Tony Stark pays for the Avengers, Xavier pays for the X-Men. All right, so yes, well, this episode is technically Life, Death, Part 2. Poor Storm. She keeps having to share her episodes. It's still a great, great episode for her. We're going to talk about her new look. Oh, I'll just say it right now. It's a Beyonce-level glow-up, which goes back to her OG look when she was first introduced in the comics. Uh, she literally rebooted herself uh but this is an, an, she, again as i said she has to share it and this is another dual episode which kind of works because they're focusing on two couples that's that's the excuse for uh making them have to share so you have two couples who are not ha- who are having you know not only having a difficult time in their relationship nice touch that they both talk about escaping to a sandy beach oh i lo- i thought that was good uh but also they're both not in genosha for the massacre. By the way, we find out that it was sinister behind the attack on Genosha, which I'm so disinterested in, you know, sinister, that I almost forgot to include that tidbit in this breakdown. I was like, ah, oh, whatever. Feige's really pushing sinister with this uh, season of X-Men 97. So I think the rumor about him wanting to make sinister the first live action villain for the MCU X-Men must have some weight to it. But I gotta say, I'm still not a Sinister fan, and X-Men 97, as good as this show is quickly becoming, is not changing my mind. I mean, the season's not done, but it would have to do an awful lot to make me a Sinister fan. Are you a Sinister fan? I mean, especially as the main villain. If he wants to traipse around in the background and, you know, be like the male Emma Frost and throw out some barbs and steal some people's DNA, that's fine. But I don't want to see him as the main villain. And I would, I would hope that the total lack of interest in Sinister from all X-Men 97 fans, never see him trending, uh, hopefully discourages Feige from pursuing that, uh, that, that idea. Uh, so yes, back to the Genosha massacre. As many of you anticipated, no Gambit and no Magneto in the opening credit sequence. They did add Nightcrawler, though, who's not in this week's episode. But I guess that means that post-Genosha, Nightcrawler's back on the team. I thought it was really great how they handled both couples finding out about Genosha. Storm and Forge found out about it on the news, like the X-Men did at the end of the last episode. Forge is probably so sorry he turned on that TV. They were right on the verge of a makeout session, thanks to not only making up, but Storm's amazing new look. Uh, The look on Storm's face was really, really well done, too, when she found out uh, what had happened. Uh, But... Again, the Xa- uh, sa- sadly, she had to share her episode, and the Xavier reveal was better. All right, so he's in the middle of astral plane detention. I thought it was hilarious that Lord Araki raised his hand to speak in class. He saw what happened to Death Bird, and she didn't raise her hand, so I thought that was funny that he was willing to play along. Ever the diplomat, I guess. Uh, but suddenly, the globe on Xavier's astral plane desk starts to spin and then explodes with Gambit's energy signer- signature. Almost as if that is the exact moment of his death. Chills! Really good stuff. Felt across the stars by Xavier. Uh, then Gambit appears, you know, like the ghost of Gambit, or like, you know, the expression of his, his mind, maybe, right? And then he morphs into a corpse, and then he turns into a sentinel attacking. Ah! Uh, you know, kind of telling Xavier, not only devastating Xavier, and really putting the guilt on him, which, you know, he kind of deserves. Uh, although, what could have Xavier done if he had been? Maybe, I don't know. It w- I mean, we'll never know, because he wasn't there. Uh, it was interesting, you know, they did the previously on, and Magneto was like, let's not wonder what might have happened if we didn't do what we were supposed to. And you're like, oh, burn on Xavier, and everyone who wasn't there. Why weren't, so why were so many X-Men not there? Uh, all right, so, 
Uh, I wonder why Xavier didn't feel Magneto's death, right? Why didn't he feel that across, uh, across the cosmos? Because they're closer. I mean, Xavier even mentions uh, uh, Magneto earlier in the episode as someone he doesn't want to forget. You know, is, does that mean that maybe Magneto is not dead or Magnus, as Charles calls him? Is, is he maybe not dead? Uh, they took him out of the opening. Is that just a misdirect? I mean, let's see. So yeah, let's start with Xavier and Lalandra. Classic X-Men romance. Uh, Xavier, you know, gets around, I gotta say. Uh, but their romance spun out of the whole Phoenix storyline. Ah, uh, you know, it was a crazy, crazy first meet. But that's right, the X-Men have spent a lot of time in space over the years, and their greatest hits are the Shi'ar Empire, a bird-like race of aliens, the Brood, a bug-like race of aliens. Are you sensing a theme? Uh, and of course, also the Star Jammers. Cyclops is dead, basically doing his best Guardians of the Galaxy impression. Uh, by the way, oh, there's a lot of there's a lot of duality in comics, as you're going to see in this very breakdown. All right, but but that was Vulcan, I believe, as part of the Imperial Guard. Basically, the Imperial Guard are the Shi'ar. I'll, I'll tell you who Vulcan is in a moment. But first things first, the Imperial Guard are basically the Shi'ar Avengers. Um, and it's not made up of Shi'ar, members of the Shi'ar Empire, interestingly enough. But it's headed up by Gladiator, and they had a lot of classic members spotlighted here. But who I'm interested in is Vulcan, who has never been a member of the Imperial Guard, interestingly enough. Uh, but first off, who is Vulcan? Well, for those of you who haven't already gasped along with me, he is the third long-lost Summer's brother. Uh, Cyclops, Havoc, and then Vulcan. Uh, I never liked Vulcan, but that didn't mean I didn't get excited about the potential uh, storyline, because I do like Cyclops. So this is a relatively new development in the comics, all right? So at one point, Vulcan even went on to become the emperor of the Shi'ar Empire. So there's, there's some, there's some storyline there. And it's interesting that here he's depicted as a member of the Imperial Guard, because in the comics, he was ripped from Catherine Summers' womb after the Shi'ar Emperor killed her. Ah, oh, dark stuff, right? Uh, the comics used to really cook. Uh, save, you know, and the Shi'ar saved his life, but only so that he could be a slave, who in the comics they exported to Earth. But here it seems maybe they kept him in the Shi'ar Empire and put him on their superhero team, and maybe he doesn't know his true story just yet, which is a classic superhero comic book drama storyline, right? He doesn't know who he really is. So don't be surprised if we return to pick up on this storyline with Vulcan and the Summers Brothers, maybe in a later season, right? Because we know they've already written season two and are working on season three right now. So this, I think, is, you know, it's I think that's definitely Vulcan. And so you can't just put Vulcan in there and never do anything about it. This, although you think they would highlight him a little bit more. This episode also highlights the Shi'ar gods, Kithri and Shara. And I was like, is this who I think it, it is? And it is. Oh, I'm so excited to share this with you. This is a fantastic Easter egg. All right, so as Gladiator explains in the episode, they were enemies forced to marry, only to fall in love and create stability in a very pro-marriage story, apparently. Uh, Xavier, though, I guess because he's having a bad time in his relationship, says their, their story is a fairy tale. He's like, that's a nice fairy tale. But guess what, Xavier? We've met them. That's right. They've been in the comics. And this uh, is one of my favorite com uh, comics, actually, uh, from the Mighty Thor run where Jane Foster was Thor. So this is uh, issue 16, uh, which spotlighted these Shi'ar gods, uh, where Jane Foster went head to head with them as part of the Asgard Shi'ar War storyline. Incredible artwork. Oh, it was so good. Because I love the idea of having uh, Asgard uh, go and interact with gods from other religions and places. You know, Thor did that during the God Butcher storyline, and then Jane Foster did it a little bit here. But I thought going with the Shi'ar in particular was so cool because they were not only space gods, but they were from a very different corner of the Marvel Universe. So it really tied everything in so well. I mean, I just thought it was incredibly clever. And uh, that's actually the only storyline I've ever read of those two Shi'ar gods, but it's stuck in my brain because I loved it so much. So as soon as I saw them here, well, my first thought actually was that uh, was, that's a very inappropriate statue. <laughs> I was like, this is like in a main hall. Oh, well, nobody seemed to go in that hall. And they said that the Shi'ar felt that art was depraved. And I'm like, mm, I think maybe you guys are projecting that because you're making some pretty kinky art. Uh, but anyway, yeah, and then my second thought was, I remember these two, they're amazing. Uh, by the way, speaking of uh, getting, getting it on, 
there are some kids spinning out of these, uh, some of these uh, uh, couplings in the comics. So Xavier and Lalandra actually end up having a daughter. Oh, they, never really did. they never really did anything with either of these kids. And then Gladiator has a, a son called Kid Gladiator. And, you know, those are more like amuse-bouche uh, Easter eggs because, again, as I said, they've never been in a single, like, good storyline. All right, but back to this episode. I can, you know, they do it, you know, just like we're complaining about the MCU giving everybody a kid, they do it in the comics. All right, so back to this episode itself. I can see why Deathbird would demand that Xavier wipe his life on Earth from his memory, or actually Lalandra would have to do it, because it's an obvious play for the throne. But come on, that Lalandra is like, good idea, sis. I mean, that's a toxic relationship, Xavier. He should have run right there. Here's another red flag in their relationship, that Lalandra's making him wear that robot suit so everybody thinks he can walk. I mean, love him the way he is, Lalandra. Although I did think it was funny that during their super serious conversation, the suit would make sad, awkward, hydraulic noises. Like, oh, sad noise. <laughs> it's like, vr, vr. All right, Ross Mercond, by the way, AKA Affordable Ultron and Red uh, Skull, is actually a really good voice for Xavier. I'll say. He's not only affordable, but dare I say, in all these cases, scooch better. Now, we all know that Xavier wasn't going to stick around. And thank goodness, because at this point, I have read way too many royal and or space marriage storylines. That's right. There's a lot of them. And they're almost always boring. Very little heat in these stories. They're not good. It was pretty, I mean, the wedding issue is always fun, but that's about it. You get a nice spread. You go, ooh, that's what a space wedding looks like, huh? And then you're like, oh, make them break up. It was pretty great to see Deathbird, though, right? Because sure, this is sort of a ripoff of Starfire and Blackfire. As I said, lots of duality in the comics. But I looked it up. Lalandra and Deathbird came first. But anyway, Deathbird is a pretty iconic character from the 90s. Uh, Jim Lee drew the hell out of her like he drew the hell out of everybody. But, you know, Deathbird was on the list. She also dated Bishop for a while. And they've always been trying to bring Deathbird back because for a while there, she was just so well-liked well, well, well liked and so cool. They're like, we got to be able to do something with her. And they never figured out what to do with her. So anyway, Bishop did date her in like a miniseries. That was pretty good. Uh, but she, and she also was Vulcan, by the way, because they tried to make Vulcan work. They were like, I know, we'll put Deathbird with him. And it didn't really help Vulcan, but they did cause a lot of problems for the Shi'ar Empire. Now, you wouldn't know it from this episode, but she's actually usually an anti-hero in the comics. Think Loki, but crossed with Mystique, because Loki's almost entirely good these days, but Mystique still can be pretty bad, and that's the same with Deathbird. Like, she will sometimes help you, but she will also then maybe sometimes stab you in the back. Uh, I loved how they animated her claws this episode. They looked fantastic. Uh, and it was nice to see the Kree again, right? That was a nice little Easter egg, complete with Ronan. Uh, who the MCU, by the way, oh, has never really figured out what to do with. The whole Kree Empire, right? I mean, if done correctly, these alien races should really land. And as soon as you see them, you should be like, oh, wow, this is going to be great. The, like how I felt at the beginning of this episode when the Shi'ar showed up. I was like, oh, awesome. But, you know, when the Kree were there, I was like, oh, that, uh, is that the Kree? That's the Kree, right? Uh, because they just have not clearly enough to find them anywhere in Marvel, you know, the comics or even the MCU. The Kree are kind of like one of the most boring alien races in Marvel, the world of Marvel. The Skrull, the Shi'ar, the Brood, all infinitely more interesting. Perhaps because the Kree is the most humanoid? I don't know. All right. Uh, the only thing they really ever did was create the Inhumans. And because Kevin Feige hates Jeff Loeb and swore off the Inhumans as a result, then the Kree really got nothing. And they just totally wasted their history with Captain Marvel. Oh, well. All right. So I really liked focusing on Xavier as a teacher. I think sometimes he's just seen as a father figure or, again, as this wealthy dude who funds the X-Men and, in return, gets to mind all their business. He's like, what are you up to? And they're like, ah, oh, he's paying the bills. we got to talk to him. But to focus on his calling as a teacher here, and then he has the mindset that drives all teachers. I mean, I thought that was a nice thing to do. I liked that. He should go guest on Abbott Elementary. All right, so now let's move over to the Storm storyline. Very nicely done. And really underscores how much the live action movies, let's keep talking smack about them. I mean, there's a little good stuff there, which I'm excited to see uh, called out in Deadpool and the bad stuff. But anyway, they never really did this character justice in live action, which is insane considering how richly the comics developed her. They highlight not just her claustrophobia here, from those of you who don't know, uh, when her parents were killed in Cairo when she was little, 
uh, she was trapped in the rubble with them, and she has had claustrophobia ever since, intense claustrophobia. She usually over, always overcomes it, though, but it's always close, like it is here. But I also think the episode does a nice job highlighting the emotional cost of being hated. Oh, that was a great, that was a great zig instead of a zag. Because they could have gone with how hard it is to be a leader, which is the typical storyline, right? And they're doing it for both Storm and Cyclops, by the way, the two de facto leaders of the X-Men, who almost always seem like they have their act together, like it doesn't bother them, like they somehow manage to rise above. But to show the hate even getting to them, I think is extremely powerful. Something that so many people can relate to today, particularly because of social media, which has a, you know, social media, the ability to reach people and also the anonymity that it gives people and makes most of them like crueler, which is very sad. But, you know, social media has done so much to amplify hate. Uh, and so I think at this time to show it getting to even Cyclops and Storm, I think is a really great thing to do. Uh, even the Shi'ar called Xavier a defective human because he's a mutant, and you're like, oh, how is he the defective one? The dude's got superpowers. I mean, I mean, he should have said something, but I mean, the whole thing wasn't going well. But that's why Storm wished she was a regular person, because she was tired of all the hate. Isn't that incredible? And so she really shut down her own powers when she was given the excuse, and was therefore able to reactivate them this episode. That's what happened. So she realized that her pain and despair had not only attracted this weird bird demon, but had caused her to shut down her own powers. And so, yeah, she turned them back on in the reawakening of Storm. What a sequence, visible from space. Ah, uh, Houston, uh, we have a bad bitch in the house. Oh, uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. I know, so one of you was like, why, Grace, why do you say this stuff with when you're talking about X-Men? Because it is very bravo. It is very, you know, drama, you know? So uh, I, I'm saying it with love. Uh, so I thought it was fantastic. And somehow, by the way, her hair grew back. Whatever, as I said, I don't care. Who's gonna question this Beyonce level glow up where she went back to her very first look in the comics when she was first introduced in 1975. Uh, so as I also said earlier in this breakdown, she literally rebooted herself. And it's an iconic look for a reason, by the way. Boy, does she look great. And the animation team did a wonderful job animating it. No wonder, as I said, you know, uh, Forge, on, he's like, let's go to the beach maybe. The Forge stuff was nice. He not only got his Doctor Strange on, and I appreciated the continuity because it reminded me that the X-Men are now in the MCU. So that was nice. I was like, oh yeah, they are in the MCU now. How cool is that? Maybe Doctor Strange will show up or Wanda or somebody. But Forge was also a good boyfriend this episode. Uh, I thought it was sweet that he wanted to come with her, not only because he was worried about being alone, because things weren't looking good, but also because he knew that her claustrophobia might kick in. But he still made her go anyway. <laughs> I didn't even see him try. All right, all right, so anyway, that was hilarious. All right, so mm, I think he passed out, did he? All right, so, but overall he was a good boyfriend. And I told you, Storm, she might have slapped him last week, but she still loves him. They were just having a tiff, a, a one doozy of a tiff, but it was a tiff. As I said, lots of drama. Lots of slapping like a soap opera. But I hope you learned an important lesson, and I hope we all did, about being upfront in relationships. She's like, oh, okay, I still love you, but don't do it again. He'll do it again because they're living in a soap opera. So that's my breakdown of X-Men 97 episode six, and I'm loving it, right? Only four more episodes to go. As I said before, I think Cable's backstory is next week, and then we go into the three-part season finale, which will still be done week to week, but I'm expecting that to be a real banger. I can't wait. After a rocky first three episodes, I can't believe those are the ones they gave to press. They were the worst. But now I think this show is absolutely on fire and the best X-Men storytelling in years, in years. Hopefully it's a sign of good things to come for the X-Men as they continue to spread through the MCU. Don't go with Sinister, man. Don't do it. What do you think? All right, share your thoughts down below, subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.